Hello, I'm J.D. Harrington, Public Affairs Officer for NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. I'd like to welcome you today to this news conference where we will announce the agency's plans for the next experimental aircraft, or X-plane, otherwise known as the Low Boom Flight Demonstrator, or LBFD. Before we begin, a few items to discuss. There will be multiple segments in this news conference. The first segment will only involve one person who will come up, make some brief remarks, and then announce who will build the next X-plane. So we're leading right from the start. Um, after that, we'll show a brief video from NASA's associate or NASA's uh, acting administrator, who really wanted to be here today, but unfortunately had a prior engagement down in Florida yesterday. You might have watched it launch to the ISS. The next segment, I'll bring up a representative from the vendor that's going to build our X-plane. And finally, I'll invite a, still a few more people up to uh, the panel to answer any and all questions you might have about the low boom flight demonstrator. Now, this telecon is limited to just one hour. With this basic rundown, I'd like to introduce and bring to the podium Dr. J. Wan Shin, Associate Administrator of NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming to this news conference. Uh, today is a really history-making day because we are announcing the winner of the uh, Low Boom Flight Demonstrator contract. Uh, with this announcement, NASA is really opening a new era, uh, the 21st century X-plane era. Throughout last century, NASA, as you all know, NASA has flown many X planes in partnership with the U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force and uh, uh, our U.S. industry, achieving amazing breakthroughs in aviation. I'm so happy and excited to announce today our long tradition of solving the toughest problems uh, of flight through X planes continues. In a moment, I'll announce the name of the, uh, NASA's new partner. Uh, that has won 247.5 million dollars uh, NASA contract to design and build a supersonic X-plane. Uh, this piloted X-plane will be built specifically to fly technologies that reduce the loudness of a sonic boom to that of a gentle thumb. Uh, you heard uh, at the beginning that's illustrative, it's not a scientifically generated uh, sound, but it's illustrative sound. So we'll fly this X-plane at supersonic speeds over land, but quietly. We'll fly, uh, fly it over select U.S. cities and ask the people living and working in those communities to tell us what they heard, uh, if anything. We will provide the scientifically collected human response data to the FAA and International Civil uh, Aviation Organization, or ICAO, so that they can use the data to change the current rule that uh, completely bans civil supersonic flights over land. When the rule is changed, the door will open to an uh, uh, aviation industry ready to enter new supersonic market in our country and around the world. This X-plane is a critical step closer to that exciting future. There are so many people at NASA who have put in their best efforts to get us to this point. I want to thank all of them for their efforts, and I think it is appropriate to call out the Source Evaluation Board for their outstanding job, the chair and the uh, chief uh, procurement officer uh, with us today to celebrate uh, their outstanding job. I believe uh, today is the new beginning for NASA Aeronautics. People enjoying affordable, quiet supersonic flights in the future would say April 3rd, 2018 was the day it all began. Therefore, it is super exciting for me to announce our new partner, the winner of the contract, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company, Palmdale, California. Congratulations.
as JD mentioned, our uh, acting administrator, Robert Lightfoot, who has been real champion of this um, effort, uh, is unable to be here with us, but sends this message. Hey folks, I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today on this exciting event. Just about two years ago, former administrator Charlie Bolden joined the NASA aeronautics team to announce the winner of a contract to develop the preliminary design for this low boom supersonic flight demonstrator. Now I have the privilege of witnessing this next milestone on my watch. Just about two months ago, I unveiled our FY19 budget and new agency strategic plan. Both were framed by the phrase, exploration, it's what we do. I apply this credo just as strongly to our work in aeronautics. The drive to explore ways to make flight more efficient led to NASA developed technologies being on board every commercial aircraft flying today. And now the drive to explore solving the challenges of the sonic boom can lead to just as far reaching an impact, possibly enabling commercial supersonic flight over land anywhere in the world. Years of NASA research from all four aeronautics centers have brought us to this day. Exploring the science of sonic booms, flying modified aircraft to test methods for quieting the sonic boom, trying out new ideas in wind tunnels, taking advantage of new concepts in computational simulations. Now we are hard at work achieving the, this next big mission. This time even with others in the NASA family, like Kennedy and Johnson Space Centers, that have supported flight campaigns in their neighborhoods. This low boom supersonic demonstration mission, the X-Plane and the community flights to come, is truly a game changer. NASA and the nation will enjoy watching this much anticipated aircraft take form during the next couple of years. And I look forward to feeling the excitement, awe, and pride when I see it take to the skies for the first time. So congratulations, Jay Wan. Congratulations to the low boom flight demonstration mission team at NASA Ames, Armstrong, Glenn, and Langley for creating the technologies to make this possible. And congratulations to the newest member of the low boom team, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company. The great aviation transformation begins today. That was Robert Lightfoot, NASA's acting administrator on LBFD. I'd like to bring to the stage now Dave Richardson, who's the Director for Air Vehicle Design and Technologies from Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, for a few remarks. Lockheed Martin is honored by this, uh, to be awarded this opportunity to work with NASA, uh, its, its um, historic centers, as well as its amazing people in uh, developing the low boom flight demonstrator. This is a uh, uh, experimental research aircraft. It's really the first, I think, for a, a manned uh, experimental research aircraft for NASA for, I think, a generation. So that makes it exciting, but I think what else is really exciting about this is that it joins the, the annals of other historic X planes that have, uh, in history, that have pushed back the frontiers of uh, aviation technology, science, innovation, but we were talking earlier about, as we were looking at the airplane, I think one of the, the most important things is that it will inspire the imagination of generations to come, uh, as these other X-Planes did me when I was a, a kid. Um, there have been people, as we've talked about this airplane and we showcased it uh, as, during the last two years of development, that have asked questions like, where do the passengers fit? Um, or again, Lockheed Martin, we do a defense contract. Some people have said, well, where do the missiles go? Uh, thinking that this was maybe about uh, acoustic stealth or something like that. I want to be clear uh, that uh, this airplane, much like the, the classic Bell X-1 or the, uh, the North American X-15, this is a purpose-built uh, experimental research aircraft. Uh, it is not a prototype for a supersonic business jet. It is not a prototype for some weapon system or uh, it is not a derivative or, or a modification of some other existing airplane. NASA gave very specific and unique requirements for this aircraft. Uh, and this aircraft was designed from a clean sheet uh, to perform, uh, one, safety of the pilot, uh, but there's some performance parameters and then the, the low boom characteristics. And it's that low boom characteristic that I think is, uh, is, is really important in, 
and understanding that it's not about making a, a, a new airplane for airplane's sake, although I love airplanes. Uh, like all these X-planes and, and to NASA's um, uh, tenants, it's about the data that will be uh, collected. Uh, Jay Wan talked about that earlier, uh, about this aircraft uh, having data taken over test ranges as well as in communities. And it's that data that is used then to shape the future. Uh, just like these other X-planes in the past, they, they generated data. And, and that data is, is the data that we use today as we design aircraft. This data will be used to inform decisions that are made, as well as set guidelines uh, for future uh, commercial supersonic aviation. And to that extent, we're really thrilled to be part of this. Uh, it was mentioned that this is day one. Uh, actually, this goes back probably, for some, uh, 50 years. And the efforts that have been made to uh, bring uh, supersonic overland flight in the United States and across the world. Uh, for, for NASA, again, it's just decades and decades, and all that technology has been brought on board this aircraft, as well as processes and tool sets that have uh, been developed by NASA. For Lockheed, uh, we've been at this for a little over 25 years. Uh, and again, all of those things that we have been working on as far as technologies, processes, concepts have all been leveraged in the design of this low boom flight demonstrator. To that end, uh, we're very confident uh, as we go forward from here uh, in the design that we have in being able to achieve that low boom signature to deliver this aircraft to fly in 2021. That's a uh, little, little over two years away, early in 2021. I think that it will go by really fast and it will go by really slow. I think uh, I'll lose a lot more hair in the time uh, between now and then. But again, we're, uh, we're excited about this. I can't emphasize enough how thrilled we are at Lockheed Martin to be working with NASA, uh, to continue working with NASA uh, to, uh, to realize uh, this vehicle and have it fly in the next several years. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. As we get ready for the Q&A session, I need to bring up still three more people to the podium. Uh, for the Q&A, once they make, while they're making their way up here, we'll let you watch this short video on low, the low boom flight demonstrator. Gentlemen. Good stuff. We're really excited about this. I'd like to welcome our panelists on the stage right now. First, we have Ed Wagner, Program Director for NASA's Integrated Aviation Systems Program at NASA headquarters here in Washington, D.C. He's responsible for ensuring the low boom flight demonstrator is built on time and on budget. Ed can also talk about LBFD's role in ARMD's overall portfolio. Next, Ed, we have Peter Cohen, project manager for NASA's Commercial Supersonics Technology Project from NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Peter is NASA's main point of contact for all community research, uh, community response research that LBFD will help conduct. Next to Peter, we have another Peter, Peter Yosefidis, I hope I pronounced that properly, uh, who's the low boom flight demonstrator program manager on the Lockheed Martin side. He's based out of the company's Skunk Works facility in Palmdale, California. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. We're now gonna start the question and answer session. We have several reporters here in the room as well as many on the telephone bridge. And we're also gonna take questions from social media from the general public. Now, because we have so many people that are involved, we will need to limit everyone to one question with one follow-up, 
and once everyone's had a chance to ask a question, we'll start from the beginning once again. I ask that everyone identify yourself, your media affiliation, and please direct your question to a specific panelist, if possible, to eliminate any confusion. For those dialing in, push the star one keys on your telephone to be placed in the queue. And for social media, use the hashtag AskNASA to ask your question. And with that, let's get started. Anyone from the room here have a question? All right. All right. We have one question here. Yes, thank you. I'm Tom Risen with Aerospace America. Uh, congratulations. Uh, and uh, good luck on the project. I was wondering, have you done any work on the community response uh, planning? I know you still have to build the plane, but uh, response of people who are going to be near the... Because the, the boom rolls for 40 kilometers in either direction, so you'll have to plan out where this is going to happen. Have you planned out where you will do the test flights eventually? Um, so uh, we've NASA's been working quite some time on uh, planning and risk reduction for the community response testing phase that will take place. Uh, we've done tests at uh, NASA Armstrong uh, using an F-18 and a unique dive maneuver that creates something that sounds like a low boom sound to start to test how you do uh, surveys, um, how, you, how you measure the, the noise, um, how you record the information. Um, we're planning a risk reduction test in the near future uh, over a larger community, uh, again using that F-18 dive maneuver but with people that are not experienced with the sound. Um, as the community, as the aircraft is being built in parallel, we will be planning in detail the community response testing. We'll be working with the international community to make sure we get the survey questions uh, that will satisfy the needs of, of, of those regulatory bodies. Uh, we'll be working with uh, local authorities and national authorities to, to get the permissions or the, you know, uh, that are required uh, before we fly supersonic over land and we'll be selecting the communities, but we have not selected any particular community yet. We will be surveying large numbers of people. We're talking about, as you, as you mentioned, it's 40 kilometers wide. Our basic mission calls for a 50 by 50, foot, 50, by 50 square mile uh, test area. So that's a lot of people to survey, but that's the kind of data that we, we want to get uh, to ensure that we've got a good representation of the population that will be potentially exposed to supersonic overflight. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what uh, Peter said, so it's really important that the data uh, that we obtain is representative of a wide diversity of communities because that's, that's who are going to be exposed to uh, this sound. And so we'll be flying over medium-sized cities, large cities, urban areas, small towns, urban uh, populations as well as rural populations so that when we gather these data, and we look at it, it will be representative of the diversity of the populations that will be exposed uh, to the sounds. That's really important to us to make sure that we capture all of those data. All right, thanks, Ed. Uh, we're go now going to the uh, phone bridge. I believe we have Alan Boyle from GeekWire on the line. Yes, hello, I'm Alan Boyle with GeekWire. Uh, I wanted to follow up on that question. M maybe you could talk a little bit about the uh, time frame. I know you're supposed to start flying in 2021. Uh, how long do you expect the test period to last? And will you be uh, using data from experiments uh, such as the flights that were flown with Honeywell, uh, or is this strictly based on Lockheed Martin technology? Um. So uh, the, the, the plan is for the first flight for the low boom flight demonstrator to be in uh, fiscal year uh, 21, the summer of, uh, of, of 2021. Uh, after the first flight, there'll be a, uh, a, a flight clearance phase where we'll prove that the airplane's safe to fly and that it meets the mission performance. Following that phase, there'll be what we call the acoustic validation phase where we'll find out does the, does the aircraft do the, the quiet supersonic signature uh, that we expect. Notice I'm not using the word sonic boom. I'm trying to ban that from everybody's vocabulary. <laughs> um, so that ex that, that's expected to last through about uh, September of uh, 2022. And immediately following that, we will conduct our first uh, community response test. We'll pre pretty much have that ready to go. Uh, that test will be conducted, uh, flown from uh, NASA Armstrong. 
uh, but will take place in a community in the southern, uh, southwestern U.S. that's not normally exposed uh, to sonic booms. We plan to do about two community response tests per year. Uh, we're looking to get a total of four to six total tests. Again, as I mentioned, to get that good representative, rep representative database of cities, towns, and, and rural areas uh, in, across the United States. Um, as far as the technology goes, uh, you know, the, the shape of the aircraft uh, was, was developed by Lockheed Martin uh, based on, on work done with NASA in the past. So that, I guess, is their, that, that's their piece. Uh, we will be using uh, flight planning uh, software. Uh, that will be very important for getting the exposure, uh, the sonic boom exposure that we want. Uh, we haven't really decided whether or not we'll need a display, um, such as the Honeywell and Rockwell uh, activities that uh, were recently sponsored by NASA under an NRA, a cockpit display of the boom, but we will have flight planning and flight management software on the airplane to enable us to fly the missions and ex get the boom exposure levels that we want to have. So I guess one additional thing, these, these tests will last about three years, we think, and are structured to mesh up with key international meetings where we'll provide these data for the international rule makers. So it's really important that we stay on schedule, that we begin these tests, uh, in 23, early 23 when we hope, then fly 23, 24, 25, and being work, working with both the U.S. community through the FAA and the international community to make sure we're providing the right data at the right time. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Once again, if you have a question here in the room, just raise your hand. If you're on the phone bank, you can push the star one key, and you can use Ask NASA on social media. Right now, I have to admit, I can't do everything myself. I have a partner in crime that's helping, with, helping me with social media. I'd like to introduce Stacia Massengill. Do we have any social media questions? We do. We have a question from Facebook. Is NASA building a commercial supersonic prototype aircraft? Should we say it in unison? No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, as, as, Dave, as Dave explained, uh, this is this is a this is an, an X plane an experimental aircraft designed for a specific purpose uh, to collect uh, data about low noise supersonic <coughs> flight and collect data about public response uh, to supersonic flight. Uh, the technology and the information that comes out of this program could eventually be used in a commercial product, but this is not a prototype for a commercial aircraft. All right, thanks, Peter. Uh, once again, we're going back to social. If anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand. We'll come to the uh, audience here in just a moment. Daisha? One more question from Facebook. Uh, you call this an X plane. When will it get an X number? And what is the process? Um, so uh, essentially, that's the, the mission uh, designation series uh, uh, for aircraft. The F, the, F, the B, the X uh, is handled by the DOD. Now that we've selected Lockheed as a, as a contractor, it is the, actually the manufacturer uh, of the product, uh, the aircraft, that uh, um, applies for that designation with the military. NASA will support that application. It will be reviewed by the DOD, and an X-plane designation will be issued, most likely fairly quickly. We expect certainly by the end of the summer to have a, an X number. All right, we've got one, one question from the audience here. Uh, Gray Warwick, Aviation Week here. Uh, can I just ask, look at, looking at the aircraft here, is there any difference, significant difference, between the design that you ended up with at the end of PDR and what you will build? So, uh, actually, what you see here today uh, in front of you was produced about a year and a half ago, and the design that we uh, showed at the preliminary design review last summer is almost identical. One of the things I, I would like to compliment NASA on is they have established very good requirements, uh, mission requirements for this airplane, and those requirements have, st have stayed stable throughout this entire process, which has not changed the design and therefore has allowed the whole program to proceed exactly as planned. And uh, that's a compl compliment to NASA because that's rarely the case. Typically, you have a lot of design changes, as you learn, and over the last two, two years, uh, we have not seen that. Thanks, Peter. Uh, one last chance. We got any questions here in the audience or in the media 
Telecon? Okay, another question here on the front. I think this is on. Yeah, on. Uh, Caroline Tucker with NBC Own Stations. And um, I have two quick questions. One, when is um, the build out on this going to begin, the construction of this experimental plane? And also, um, how do you want commercial entities to end up using this data in the future? I'll take the first part as far as when we're going to start building it. Uh, we will we will start immediately right now in taking the preliminary design that was developed last summer and now taking that to a detail, detail design and then moving forward with the actual manufacturing, which will start in earnest uh, approximately next summer. Uh, as far as uh, the second part of your question, Peter would probably be better suited to answer that. So um, if you look at uh, the way air aircraft are certified today, there are regulations that that describe how the aircraft must perform, uh, both in terms of safety and the best example is noise. All aircraft are certified to meet a certain noise level. So one of the things that we really hope that this data will, will give the international community is that noise level. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying no supersonic flight over land, the FAA or the, will say to the, to the manufacturer, if your airplane produces a sound level less than X dB, uh, it's okay to fly over land. And all you have to do is prove to us um, through a certification process um, that your aircraft meets that level. And we understand the types of um, guidelines that are needed in shaping the vehicle. So you can look at this. You can see, you know, this is long, it's slender. Uh, it's done as a system. It's not, a, you know, it's not a fuselage and then somebody put a wing on it and somebody put canards on it, horizontal tail. It was done as a system so that you, when you can go nose to tail and understand the biometric changes on all the, all the components there, and so then when you do that right, when you understand those guidelines and design this right and build it right, it will be able to fly with significantly less noise signature than what we see today. Thanks, Ed. Uh, once again, if you're on the phone bridge and you'd like to ask a question, you can push the star one key on your phone to be placed in the queue. We're going back to the phone bridge right now. We have uh, Bloomberg's Tom Black on the line. Tom? Hi. My question has to do with the, the second uh, plane that NASA is, is talked about. When will you make a decision on that? Is the idea to, to allow this one to fly and and to get it to uh, if, see if it works, I guess, on the signature before you make that decision, or could it, become, could it come earlier? Right now, right now, within the budget guidelines that we have, we're working, we're focused on this vehicle, and we're really excited about this vehicle. Many other subsonic technologies we're working and trying to, trying to understand the best way to validate those technologies in a realistic environment, that most of the time it's flight because they've been tested in wind tunnels, that we've uh, done computational analyses. But as far as specific plans for another experimental, full-up experimental vehicle, we're not working that right now. Right now we're focused on making sure that we've got the resources uh, in place to build the low boom flight demonstrator, that we've got the, the monitoring and control piece in place so that we'll stay on time, on budget, and that we're, while we're working these other technologies, we're looking at what those opportunities will be in the future as we're successful on this demonstrator, what they'll be in the future to demonstrate those other subsonic technologies that we want to test. Thanks, Ed. Okay, we're going to go around the room one more time. Any questions here? Okay, we have one more question over here on the left. Hi, it's Carrie Lynch with Aviation International News. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the plane itso itself, the size of it, how fast you're hoping to get it to go, um, if you've looked at what engines you've looked at. Mm -hmm. I can take that. The airplane is 94 feet long. Uh, it will fly at 1.4 Mach at 55,000 feet. Uh, what you see uh, in front of you as far as the airplane is a brand new shape. Everything else within the airplane is existing commercially off the shelf or salvaged from other aircraft. That was one of the guiding principles that we had in designing this airplane is to make it as affordable as possible. So the only thing is that is new is the shape. The canopy is off a backseat of a T-38. The landing gear is from an F-16. And the engine is a General Electric uh, 
414, 400, and a lot of the subsystems have come off of either F-16 or F-18 aircraft. There's really no new development of any major components uh, as part of this effort. Thanks, Peter. Uh, we're going to go back to the phone lines, but in the meantime, if you have a question on social media, you can use Ask NASA, Ask NASA the uh, hashtag Ask NASA, and uh, we'll get your question here as soon as we can. So those on the phone bridge, by all means, push the star one key and we'll uh, get you in the queue. Right now we're going back to the phone line. We have Mark Selinger from the Defense Daily. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you tell us whether there were any other um, bidders for this contract? And uh, if so, uh, why Lockheed uh, was uh, selected? And also, what is the next milestone for the program? Is it critical design review? And if so, when? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we ended up with one bidder. Um, we had three inquiries, I think, to the um, request for proposals, and we provided them preliminary design data so that everybody, there would be a level playing field. Uh, while we only had one bidder, we went through an exhaustive analysis and evaluation of that bid. And uh, quite honestly, the, uh, the bid that Lockheed Martin put together was deemed excellent uh, in every aspect that we looked at. So we, after we went through the initial evaluation of the bid, we went out with a series of questions for Lockheed Martin to respond to. The responses, again, were just excellent. And so they clarified some, some places where it wasn't exactly clear uh, from, the, from the proposal. But from a government point of view, we think we're getting a bargain. So we laid out requirements. We've held those requirements. This vehicle meets those requirements and at, from our point of view, a very affordable price. So we've got the budget. We've got the resources to do this. We think that Lockheed Martin will be an incredible partner in bringing expertise to the table uh, to enable us to meet our schedule and, um, and cost requirements for this vehicle. And we're convinced in what, what we've seen so far that this is going to meet the requirements that we need to provide the data to the regulatory community that will allow us to change the noise standards as uh, we have them in place right now. Thanks for the question, Mark. When, when, and programmatically, the next step is a contract kickoff meeting, uh, which, should, which will take place in May. Uh, followed by a Delta preliminary design review plan for uh, the July timeframe, and then uh, critical design review is planned for September of 2019. Thanks, Peter. Uh, we're going back to the uh, social media and Daisha. Twitter user Amanda Gott would like to know what is the science behind this project that allows for the low boom as opposed to a regular one, and part two. Could the aircraft be sized up to accommodate more passengers? <laughs> Good um, question. I guess I'll take that one. Uh, so essentially, a sonic boom happens because the air does not know that the airplane is coming. Uh, because the airplane is traveling faster than sound and pressure only travels at the speed of sound, all pressure changes that take place as the air tries to flow around a supersonic aircraft take place through shock waves. And there's shock waves on the nose of the aircraft, on the wings, on the engine inlet, on the canopy. All those shock waves are different strengths, and they're kind of randomly positioned along the length of the airplane. So what happens is because they're different strengths, they start to catch up with one another, and they rapidly coalesce into just the two pressure pulses that you hear as a bang bang of a sonic boom. So in, sim in, in simplest terms, sonic boom reduction is controlling the shape is controlling the strength and the position of the shock waves to prevent that coalescence. So each wave travels out uh, from the aircraft, it travels towards the ground. The only thing that happens to it is it attenuates. They tend not to merge and become that stronger, uh, stronger waveform. So that uh, at, by the time you reach the ground, the sound is attenuated to a thump or a double thump uh, in, instead, of, instead of a boom. Let me just go a little further as to uh, why, why this works. Uh, during a different effort with NASA uh, back in 2011 uh, called N plus 2, we actually demonstrated that we could predict uh, the methods for mm -hmm. predicting that boom and then testing it in a wind tunnel and validating that the predictions were actually very much in lockstep with the results. 
which really uh, allowed the confidence to be built to a point that now we thought we could actually go forward or NASA could go forward with a full-scale airplane and achieve the noise levels that it will establish for this X-plane. Peter, Peter makes a very important point. When we started, the idea was not to do an X-plane. The idea was to prove that we had the technology that could enable the design of a quiet uh, civil supersonic aircraft. So we tested that uh, in a wind tunnel. Then we set about, well, how are we going to prove that technology and how are we going to get this key data? So that's how we came up with the X-plane. And if you look at the features of, of it, the length, the slenderness, the position of the components, some of the unique smaller lifting surfaces, such as the canard and the, and the small T-tail, that's all about positioning the shock waves. But in the end, that type of information will aid in the design of a civil supersonic aircraft but you wouldn't physically scale this airplane up big enough to put passengers in it. You'd take a new design approach. But what this, what this will allow us to do is validate some of the methodologies that we have in place that will allow us then to scale it up and design a vehicle that would be large enough to, to carry passengers. So we'll, we'll be doing flight testing. We've got computational methodologies and, of course, experimental methods that all three of those working together builds the confidence in any of the designs that we're doing. So now we're going to have something that we've got true flight test data on uh, from an acoustic point of view as well as an aerodynamic point of view, uh, structures, all of these things, then that will all go together when someone comes along after the rules are changed, someone comes along and can make that business case and is ready to design a commercial vehicle. Thanks, Ed. And with that, I think we're going to close today's news conference. I'd like to thank the panelists and Daisha for their time today. Uh, for more information about NASA's low boom flight demonstrator or any other NASA aero related project, or for any other NASA project for that matter, you can go to the web at www.nasa.gov. And with that, thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. And remember, NASA's with you when you fly. <laughs>